Hey yo, and what is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. Monday Night Raw once again was just too much. You could count on Monday Night Raw to bring your Monday nights to a depressing, grinding halt and almost put you into a slight slumbering coma that you might not even wake up from because it is just that bad. If you're not getting repeat matches from the week before, you are getting just a bunch of nonsense. That's just too much. Too much Nia Jax. Too much women's division. Too much of people from SmackDown. Too much of Charlotte Flair. Too much of Seth Rollins and his Monday Night Man Bun and all of these things and so much more just bringing you down on your Monday nights. And what they didn't have, what they didn't have was enough brain power to come together and come up with something meaningful and important for a superstar the caliber of a Kevin Owens who is just now returning from his WrestleMania moment, his epic victory over the Monday Night Man Bun himself. And the best thing you got for him is an unadvertised appearance with no hype surrounding a Kevin Owens show that has absolutely nothing to do with him. We are going to talk about all of that and so much more right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare and you are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Monday Night Raw Review and Reaction Show. Let's do it. <laughs> Before we get started with tonight's Monday Night Raw review, we have to come at you with some, some news that we got earlier today, and it is not of the good variety. This is very sad and very tragic news that really just was brought to my attention just before Raw went on the air, and the fact of the matter is that former WWE superstar Shad Gaspard, one half of the beloved Crime Time tag team duo is apparently passed away today. He was swimming with his son at Venice Beach in California. And the two were caught in a very heavy riptide. Apparently this riptide hit the beach and put many people's lives in danger. Rescue teams scrambled and reportedly made it to Shad in the water, who then directed them to focus their attention on his son and please rescue him first. To which they did, but they were then unable to find the former WWE superstar after his son was safely procured. Rescue efforts and the search continued throughout the day today. Those efforts have been unsuccessful. He is still missing as of this moment and supposedly has passed and perished in this terrible, terrible accident. All of these reports coming in. They, they point to the fact that he passed away a hero. This man was a hero. Beyond what he's done in WWE, in his final moments, it, it measured him as a man. There he was. He had an opportunity to save his life. He probably thought he was going to be able to save himself. He's a big, strong man, probably had confidence in his swimming abilities and prioritize his son's life over his own. Being a father myself, I imagine that I would do the exact same thing. He deserves nothing but love and respect That in, in his final moments, doing the most noble thing you can do, and that would be sacrifice yourself for the greater good of your offspring. Any of you parents at home, you, you know... How that probably hits home if you're watching me right now. That It's just a terrible, terrible thing that has happened to this family. My thoughts and prayers go out to his wife and his surviving family, as well as his very many close friends in the world of professional wrestling. Not just JTG, his former partner, but many people who I have seen on social media who are all just gathering together to show their support and hope Hope that maybe there's a possibility that, that he may have swam somewhere and, and is safe right now. And while that's not out of the realm of 
possibilities, it is very highly unlikely. So, uh, rest in peace to Shad Gaspard. Uh, I'm proud of him for for doing what he did, uh, and it's terrible, man. This whole year has just really been terrible. There, there's no way to even segue from that from that story into getting into the Raw review. But but if we're being honest, 2020 has just been one gut punch after the other. Even outside of the, the worldwide crisis that we are all facing right now, we've lost so many people, not just in the world of professional wrestling, but if, if you're into sports, you know, you, we lost Kobe Bryant. We lost Howard Finkel. Now we're having things like this happen to guys who should not be leaving this world at the age that they are with families. It's just, it's just too much. It's just too much. There we go. <laughs> Here's a good way to segue while both both situations are completely opposite. That's too much in a different way. Monday Night Raw really was just too much tonight. And not too much like, oh, man, that was too much. Did you see that? That was just amazing. No, this was the complete opposite kind of too much. The kind of too much that makes you want to just turn the TV off and do literally anything else. You would rather pick the fungus from your toes. I can give you a list of shows you could be better occupying your your eyeballs with. You could be playing a whole bunch of games and doing literally anything else. But you could do unimportant things and you would still be doing things better with your time. You could just go make a bowl of jello. Why not do that? It doesn't take nearly as much time, but you're going to get an infinite amount of enjoyment out of it, especially if you got a little whipped cream in the fridge. There's no whipped cream you could sprinkle on Monday Night Raw to make it taste any better, feel any better, look any better. This company is absolutely clueless. Clueless. You want to come at me with an axe-throwing contest. An axe-throwing contest for the Viking Raider, Warrior Raider Raiders to outdo... They're street profits. And it's, it's it's just the exact opposite of what we seen last week. Last week, we seen the basketball game, which was the street profits being able to, to man up and show that they're superior to the Viking Raiders. And now this week, we got the Viking Raiders in their element. But this segment was full of nothing but clever cut angles, trick photography, and bad comedy. Bad comedy like one of the street prophets, I believe it was Montez, setting up to throw his axes. And he looked like an idiot doing it because he doesn't know how to throw an axe. But he's doing it like you would roll a bowling ball between your legs down the alley. If you don't know how to, to throw a ball like a real bo- bowling ball would be thrown, you, you use two hands like a five-year-old. And you throw, This guy's holding the axe. He's swinging it between his legs. He's bringing it up. He's throwing it 50 yards down the way. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And while he's doing this, he's teeing up, and he's like, I'm going to get my Tiger Woods on. And then you got the Viking Raiders like, oh, what? There's tigers in the woods? Am I supposed to be like, ha-ha? Because that wasn't funny. It wasn't funny. It wasn't any funny, any funnier than the other stupid puns and jokes they had. Oh, oh, well, sometimes, you know, performance happens. You know, you you, you have to, you know, get get out of here. Get out of here with all of these fucking ridiculous jokes and all of this nonsense. It's just god awful. It's just sickening television. It literally makes me want to throw up. Things like that and things like having a world-renowned wrestling female like Kyrie Sane turned into a punching bag for Nia Jax while playing the flute all night. Everybody's calling it a flute. By the way, educate yourselves. Kyrie Sane was playing a recorder. It was not a flute. It was a recorder. That's what it's called. I played one in the fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth I know what it is. Many of you probably did the same. It was stupid. It's not like Kyrie Sane could actually play the recorder. It's not like it was a talent. They gave it to her, and she just pretended to know how to play. And it was awful. And I see people on social media, Oh, look how funny Kyrie is. Are you serious right now? Are you serious? Maybe I could take this kind of a segment from Kyrie saying if she was going out there and tearing it up 
the way we know she can, but they've done nothing but turn Kyrie Sane into a shell of her former self. She's a joke. She's a running joke. And she's being used to do nothing but garner heat for a feud with Nia Jax and Asuka that nobody wants to see. Becky Lynch taking a step away to become the mom has thrown a wrench in a woman's division that was already broken. There was no fixing it as it was. And the clear-cut answer still is staring you in the face. You put Asuka as the champion. You got Shayna Baszler just set up ready to tee off. That's all you need. The two most prolific NXT women's champions going at it for the Raw Women's title. It's as clear as Christmas Day. But we don't get it. We don't get it. We don't get gifts. We get coal. We get coal in our stocking, not just Michael Cole in our ears. We get Nia Jax versus Asuka for what? We get Shayna Baszler in this little mini feud with Natalia for Natty to be going nuts. For what? All the while, it doesn't even matter because Charlotte's here on Raw. We've seen her three friggin' times last week. She was on Raw, hyping her appearance on NXT. She was on NXT, embarrassing herself and others. And then she was on SmackDown to promote a match she's going to have on this week's SmackDown. And now she's showing up on Monday Night Raw, burying Ruby Riot, And effectively, everywhere she goes, they are just throwing the girls at Charlotte to have her win. We've seen her beat Mia Yim. We've, we're seeing her now beat Ruby Riot again. She's beating Liv Morgan. She's beating everybody she's getting in the ring with. The push of Charlotte Flair is nauseating. And it really makes me even more hurtful. Or make me feel more hurt, rather. Because I was such a Charlotte Flair guy when I seen her in NXT. All I could say to myself is, my God, imagine once she gets her wheels underneath her and she figures this shit out. She's going to be one of the biggest stars ever. But then Vince McMahon gets his hands involved and he turns her into a female Roman Reigns slash John Cena slash Hulk Hogan type. But yet she's a heel. And we're supposed... I don't understand. I don't understand the obsession with Charlotte Flair. Why they are effectively killing all three divisions and putting them all at her mercy. Because she's the queen? Who cares what she calls herself? The booking of Charlotte Flair by this company is what makes all of us hate her. This is not a personal attack against her one way or the other. I think she's probably a wonderful person, but she's a terrible promo. And she's a gifted athlete. She's she's fairly good in the ring at times. But the way they present her and the way we are constantly being fed Charlotte Flair and watching her being fed talent after talent that they are not allowing to grow on their own and they are just throwing under the bus for a woman that doesn't need to be built any higher doesn't make any sense to me. You brought in Baron Corbin. You want to talk about not making sense? You got this bullshit wild card part two for 2020 rearing its ugly head. Another gut punch from the year. Thank you very much. And you're bringing in Baron Corbin to face Drew McIntyre. It's a non-title matchup on Monday Night Raw. Why? Just so you could say first time ever? Oh, for the first time ever, Corbin versus McIntyre. Let me get something straight through your heads, WWE. We don't want to see Corbin on the actual show he's on. So by putting him on Monday Night Raw and making me have to see him twice in one week, you are effectively just making things ten times worse. I don't know how many times those of us in the community can say this phrase, but it has been echoed by me and millions of you guys. Baron Corbin does not have heat. And I'm not even going to say he has go-away heat because that... Might not be a real thing, but what he does do is he makes people change the channel. The guy's charisma is questionable at best. His wrestling ability has actually dwindled from what it once was. His potential was through the roof, and now the only thing I want to do is put my head through the roof every time he comes up on screen. 
And this was the one thing those of you who have been watching me for a long time remember when they brought the King of the Ring back. This was the one thing I didn't want them to do. I didn't want them to put it on Corbin and make him walk around all year taking a title like the King of the Ring and making it a joke, making it a mockery, making this one of the worst King of the Ring reigns that I have seen since King Mabel. That's pretty bad. If he's not wrestling Elias week after week, now he's interjecting himself with Drew McIntyre for no reason. He chose this, apparently. This is what he wanted to do. I don't give a damn what the rules of this brand-to-brand invitation crap is. I just want it to be over with. Because you had a very easy answer here. You brought back Corbin essentially to start a program between Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre, which was an unnecessary step. I think MVP is actually very good in the managerial role. I think he handles himself well. I think he's eloquent in the way he speaks. He looks like a manager would look. I think the pairing with Bobby Lashley may end up turning out for the best. And this matchup, Lashley versus McIntyre, this build towards this feud, I'm not even that mad about it. As long as they keep Lana out of it. Lana needed to show up to just scream and show her cleavage all night long. Why this broad is mad that her husband is winning, I don't understand. What does it matter if he wins whether you're out there or not? You should be happy your husband won. What are you standing in the back screaming like a jackass for? Doesn't make any sense, but that let's not spend any more time talking about that. The fact of the matter is, a few years back, Impact Wrestling actually wasn't always as bad as it is. And once upon a time, they had a world heavyweight champion, and his name was Bobby Lashley. And he actually was pretty good. He was the heel in the situation, and they had Drew McIntyre coming up. And if you've seen Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre in the six sides of the Impact ring, you know that what we can get between these guys could actually be very good. But what you're not, what you need to remember and not forget is that that was different booking from different minds. The booking of the WWE is not the same as everybody else's, so I don't expect them to give us those type of hard-fought matches that I'm used to seeing them throw down. In the WWE, they're probably going to get five, six minutes. Drew McIntyre or Claymore kick Bobby Lashley right back to the mid-card where he's going to reside for the rest of his tenure in the WWE. But this matchup and this rivalry, if you want to call it that, or this next program for Drew with Lashley is fine. It didn't need Baron Corbin. Definitely didn't need Baron Corbin. And if you're not on on that camp and you're like, no, man, screw the almighty milk dud. He doesn't need to be doing this. Then there was a better answer, an even better answer. And that answer comes in the form of two little letters, and those letters are K and O. Kevin Owens returned to Monday Night Raw tonight. And you would think that maybe his focus would be on the World Heavyweight Championship. Let me get a shot at that. I beat Seth Rollins at WrestleMania. Seth Rollins just had a shot at the championship. Why can't I get a shot at the championship? He doesn't have to turn heel. They're not turning anybody for Charlotte versus Bailey. It's two heels in that scenario. We've seen babyface versus babyface, heel versus heel all year long. And with the current climate and the fact that there's going to be no fans in attendance, you run no risk of the interaction of the fans ruining the ebb and flow of your show. So you can have Kevin Owens skirt the lines right now. Have him want the championship. Give us Owens versus McIntyre for backlash. I would be down for that. That would be good booking. That would be a good reason to bring back Kevin Owens. But they brought back Kevin Owens for a Kevin Owens show to facilitate and further along the breakup of a stable that hasn't even gotten really started yet and to reintroduce Apollo Crews into the United States Championship title picture and not even for himself. He didn't come in and do this and get a shot at Andrade for the U.S. title. He did this to help Apollo Crews. And while that's not necessarily a bad thing, I'm very confused with Apollo Crews' character right now. Was he not almost, maybe, kind of turning into a bad guy? 
having an attitude, giving people shit in the back, and not being the smiley, happy Apollo anymore. And I was all like, yeah, I can get behind that. And then they just kind of squashed him for the next couple of weeks. They book him into the money in the bank, and then they take him out for AJ Styles, and now they're going to put him back in the U.S. championship picture. What is this, a thank you for not for not breaking our balls about us screwing you over? Regardless what the intentions were, it was very unnecessary to waste Kevin Owens' return on this segment, which at the end of the day had nothing to do with Kevin Owens. This is the state of the WWE. This is the stuff that they want to give us. And it's unforgivable. It's insufferable. And it's boring as hell. There were eight matches tonight. I don't think any one of them went even close to ten minutes except possibly the last match of the night. That match didn't even get started till about almost 10-2. Almost 10 to 11. So it probably didn't go a full ten minutes. There was a lot of bullshitting tonight. A lot of backstage segments. A lot of repeats. Like we said, too much of the same people all night long. He had Asuka and Kairi Sane celebrating Asuka's championship awarding. I don't know how else she would... Gifting of the championship to her. Only to be confronted by Nyad Snacks. And we don't want to see any of that. Do you want to see Kairi Sane playing the recorder in the middle of the ring? You know what I was hoping was going to happen in this segment? It seemed to me as Kairi Sane was talking about all of Asuka's accolades that she almost was like frustrated. Did any of you guys catch the vibe that maybe it felt for a minute that Kairi Sane was going to turn around and cold clock Asuka? And why not do that? Why continually embarrass Kairi Sane and have her at the mercy of Nia Jax getting thrown around in the back? For no reason at all. Instead of doing that, break up the Kabuki Warriors. You know the girl's going to be leaving, right? She's probably not sticking around. Everybody's talking about it. So on her way out, let her wrestle Asuka and put over the champ. She'd have no problem losing to her friend. And at least it would be a nice way for her to go out. She can go out on her back. She could do the honors. And then go back to New Japan. Where she'll be taken seriously like she should be. There's, there's an interim answer. You don't want to go with Shayna Baszler versus Asuka right off the bat? There's your in-between. As you're building up Shayna Baszler, having her waste her time with people like Natalia, who wants to throw hissy fits now every time she loses, you have Kyrie Sane occupy herself with Asuka. Give us a couple of good matches, blow it off at Backlash, and then goodbye, Kyrie. You don't want her anyway. When I watch how you use her, it's clear to me you don't know what you're doing with her and you don't need a Kyrie scene. The only thing that was mildly decent on this night was the promo work between Edge and Randy Orton, which actually kicked off the show. And it was good. It's just I don't care. I don't care. You know why I don't care? And it's not the fault of either of the guys involved. Not at all, because Edge and Randy Orton, given a microphone, are fantastic. Especially in this face-to-face. Sometimes when they're in the one-on-one, it can get a little corny. It can get a little kind of like you don't give a shit what they're saying because they're working on a program that has concluded already. They're continuing a story that finished at WrestleMania, but I digress. They get in the ring together. They have this face-to-face. They talk about what they mean to each other, and they keep hyping the match as being the greatest wrestling match of all time. This is going to be a surefire greatest match that ever existed on the planet. Those are, that, that's a really high bar to set. It's a bar that there is no way these guys are going to reach, and that's not taking anything away from Edge and Randy Orton. The fact of the matter is, if you continue to say something is going to be great, and you keep building it up, and you already give it 
the hype and the pressure of being the greatest match of all time, the greatest wrestling match of all time, that's unattainable. That's unattainable. We could go through the history of professional wrestling and you will find dozens of matches that will be better than what we are going to end up getting. I don't know if they're trying to like smack us in the face because we really hated the street fight because it went on for nearly an hour and it contained a few spots that were questionable at best or if they're being serious. Never mind the fact that it's all ass backwards. You're supposed to build up to the intense matches by having the wrestling matches first. And you flip the script and you go, well, you were the better wrestler, but I'm the better man. I'm the tougher man, and I'm going to kick your ass in this street fight. You don't have the street fight where you almost kill each other and go, yeah, you almost killed me, but now I'm going to out-wrestle you. It's just backwards. Taking that out of the equation, it's still not making sense why any of it's going on. It makes just about as much sense as what they're doing with Zelina Vega and her sexy boys, the Vega Boys, which is a team now that is only a team of two. We had three men, and now we're down to two men. They have kicked out Austin Theory from the faction tonight. I'm still trying to figure out where things went wrong. They were never very clear as to why... Austin Theory and Angel Garza have been beefing over the last couple of weeks. Everything was fine. And then all of a sudden, these guys are just bickering. And there's really no meaning or rhyme or reason behind it. And now tonight, they kick out Austin Theory, which I guess is fine. He kind of felt like a third wheel anyway. And he didn't really fit the group's dynamic. He was brought in as a temporary replacement for Andrade due to his situation a couple of months ago. And he got stuck into this, and it wasn't really working, and I guess WWE felt that, and they're taking him from it. But what is the sense of taking him from one meaningless faction and putting him up with another? If you think that the Monday Night Man Bun and his disciples are any higher on the echelon of factions as Zelina Vegas and her sexy boys, then you're crazy. Because they are both about equal, if you ask me. They both mean jack shit right now. In fact, if you want to talk potential, I think Zelina Vega now narrowing it down to just Garza and Andrade might be able to actually be the better of the two teams. What the hell does Austin Theory want to do with Seth Rollins and all of his nonsense? Seth Rollins is going to help the downtrodden? He's helped Bertie Murphy, and now he's going to help... Bertie Murphy? When did he become a bird? Holy shit. He helped Buddy Murphy, and now he's going to help Austin Theory? If I were Austin Theory, you know what I'd want to do? I wouldn't want to join the man bun and his disciples. I would want to join back at NXT. Let me go back down there, put a little bit more seasoning on me. Let me get a little bit more reps in. Let me stop losing to a bunch of guys on a show that doesn't give a shit about me. And let me reestablish myself. Let me get more acquainted with the WWE way of things. And then let me come back up here when you got something for me. Don't make me second fiddle to this guy. One of the most boring guys in existence. There is something about Seth Rollins and this Messiah character that just lulls me into a a dreamlike state. And not in a good way. I'm not sitting there all dreamy-eyed. Oh, Seth, you're so dreamy. No, bro. It's like, you know, I can't stop my eyes from falling asleep. And I know Seth Blockins hates my guts because I come at him with a bunch of truth. But I'm not the one going out there and trying to be something I'm not. I am very much the sledgehammer of professional wrestling YouTube in uh, here. And I, I am the same way every single week. I am consistent. I don't betray my beliefs. And I don't try to be something I am not. He's trying to take inspiration from this Messiah TV show on Netflix. Which actually wasn't that good after the second episode. I stopped watching it. And it's not translating. 
The one thing I'll say, the good thing about him is that he gave up on his girlfriend's jacket. I guess he wanted to make sure his, his woman was nice and warm, so he gave her back that fur-lined coat. But since we're talking about bad coats, what the hell was with Buddy Murphy's little kaleidoscope jacket? Holy cow. That was a bad move. Oh, was that going to be sold on WWE Shop? Become one of the disciples. Wear the Messiah jacket with the little stained glass arms. No thanks. No thanks. But there was really nothing on this show. This show was completely lifeless. Nothing happened that you haven't seen before or that we're not going to see again next week. The biggest thing coming out of tonight was Edge accepting Randy Orton's challenge after a very good promo segment. Seth Rollins' stupid promo talking about how he sacrificed Rey Mysterio in the most boring way possible, and this only led to being interrupted by Dr. Dimples Umberto Carrillo. And did you think we were going to get Carrillo versus Rollins? No, we got Carrillo versus Buddy Murphy, and Umberto Dr. Dimples Carrillo loses once again. Why would anybody give a shit when this guy's music hits? All he does is come out and lose. If he's not losing to Andrade or Angel Garza, or Austin Theory. Now he's losing tonight to Buddy Murphy. What is the sense of it all? I don't know. Why is he even part of the roster still? I don't know. Why will they not build superstars before they bury them into the ground to an irreparable place? I don't know. Humberto Carrillo versus Buddy Murphy happened... Nobody cared. We then got Baron Corbin yelling at a stagehand backstage because he wanted some fucking food. Oh, is this how you treat your king? This kind of stuff that he was doing tonight reminded me of back in the day when Jerry the King Lola was walking around trying to avoid Brett the Hitman hard all night and doing all the stupid antics backstage. I'm a king. Don't you know how to treat me? Wah. This ain't your show. You don't belong here. If you didn't bring your own assistance, you didn't bring your own royal court, nobody's going to go fetch your shit, bro. You learned that tonight. It was fucking stupid. <laughs> fucking stupid. Oh, but anyway, I, I missed one thing. Aleister Black came out after Umberto Carrillo lost, tried to kick Buddy Murphy's jaw off, but missed, and this would only set up Another match for Buddy Murphy later in the night. A match against Aleister Black, which we have seen two or three times already actually being very, very good. But tonight wouldn't be one of those times. There was a very strange Liv Morgan promo that I didn't care for. I didn't understand. She was sitting there crying to the camera about her mom, telling everybody her mom was her hero. I guess why? Because Mother's Day just passed. We're getting this Liv Loves Her Mom promo. Her mother didn't have a job, she didn't have a savings account, but she never quit, and now Liv Morgan's never going to quit. Because Charlotte Flair beat her up last week. What? And now she's learned one day she's going to become Raw Women's Champion. Where did you learn this? Where, is this in a textbook? Did you get a DeLorean and go into the future 20 years and find some sort of a wrestling almanac that tells you you're going to be the woman's champion at some point in your career? Let me know what year that is so that I could skip wrestling that year. This was followed by a Charlotte Flair promo. They keep calling this broad the hardest working person on all three brands and all of us as a fan base are collectively asking you to please stop. Please stop. She's not Rick. It's not the same. We don't want to see Charlotte Flair on every show. Once a week is more than enough. Sometimes too much. What happened to the days in the WWE where the champion used to take a week off? Brock Lesnar was gone for months. Nobody gave a shit. Still came back and got all the respect in the world. Why can't we do the same with Charlotte? 
Build the women's division around and build Charlotte around the fact that there is no women's division. Make her not wrestle. There's nobody for me to wrestle. I ain't wrestling. I'm fucking champion. I ain't wrestling. I'm whining and dining. 69 and with Andrade. Ole! <laughs> she was here to hype her match with Bailey, and then she's like, oh, by the way, I know Ruby Riot has something to say. I guess somebody gave Charlotte Flair the call sheet to read from. How does she know Ruby has something to say? Why don't we know that Ruby has something to say? Did Ruby say something on YouTube? Was it a WWE.com exclusive? Is there a clip somewhere? Is there a tweet on Twitter somewhere? What the fuck did Ruby say? Ruby Riot's got something to say. She invited her out. She can't even let people confront them, can't confront her on her own. I'm not going to let Ruby Riot confront me. I'm going to tell Ruby to come out here because I'm the queen. I run this shit. And then she didn't say shit. She went face to face with Charlotte Flair. And then the idiots on the announcement, oh, we got this match coming up next. What? Charlotte Flair defeats Ruby Rare. Uh, Ruby Rare. <laughs> Ruby Rare. Ruby Riot. Ruby Riot. Which is actually not rare. Charlotte Flair beats everybody. This was a very, very quick match, which actually started while we were during commercial. Ruby Riot doesn't deserve for us to even see her full match. We had to see Charlotte Flair's whole diatribe, but when the wrestling starts, we don't care. <sighs> she wins with the figure eight. <clears throat> Who cares? We're going to get to see her on Wednesday, and then we're going to see her again on Friday, and I'm going to want to bash my head with this hammer every single time. Charlie Caruso tried to interview Bobby Lashley, but they were interrupted by MVP, who said that they weren't doing business together because Lashley was too busy dealing with clowns like our truth and his wife, the lovely Lana. And I'm like, yes, I already like this MVP calling it straight, telling the man the way it is. When was the last time you even sniffed a championship opportunity? You're standing around wrestling guys that think they're two people. Right? You got our truth coming out for the match, and then he puts those stupid teeth in, and we get little freaking Ricky again. Who cares? Who cares? Cousin Ricky, little Ricky. Who gives a shit? Awful stuff. Awful stuff in store. So MVP has a point. Before Lashley could maybe go after him, MVP said he didn't want Lashley to put him in the full Nelson, but he also asked him how effective he thought that move would be against a champion. MVP wondered how much Lashley even worried about that, being that it's been 13 years since he's had the opportunity to be a champion in the WWE. He then said he figures Lashley didn't need trophies because he's already got a trophy in his wife. Lashley seemed a little bit perturbed by MVP's comments, but he calmed him down. So just think about things, and I really enjoyed MVP in this moment. I think the manager role is perfect. We don't need an MVP lounge. He doesn't need to be showing up for matches that he's actually not going to wrestle in. He needs to be a manager. Bring that art form back. It is sadly lost in the world of pro wrestling. Managers are magical. And I think MVP has the potential to be one of the greats, considering the fact that there is nobody on the playing field right now to even compare him to. He could take this thing to next to the next level. And I think Bobby Lashley would be a great person to benefit from that. The less Lashley says, the better. And he won't be such a milk dud if he's being represented by MVP. And I expect big th big things from Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre. And if they don't deliver, then Poop Hammer goes to me. But that's what I feel. The Street Profits and the axe-throwing competition we talked about at the start of the show, I don't care. I, I didn't care. I barely even watched it. I Once I seen that they weren't actually throwing the axes themselves, I thought... I mean, for the most part, when we watch the basketball segment, you've seen the Street Profits playing ball. You've seen them making their shots. You've even seen the Viking Raider, Warrior Raider Raiders making their dunks at the end. Here, we didn't see anybody do shit. This was all camera foolery. 
trick, clever editing, much like they did back in the day with Mr. Perfect. But I didn't appreciate it. It was just a waste of time. And the fact that they took this one segment and broke it into four separate segments, one which would include police coming to find out who threw an axe that went into the windshield of a police car, which would then be followed by an overweight policewoman telling the Viking Raiders she's going to let this one slide because she thinks they're cute, or one of them is cute. What, uh, is this wrestling? Or is this Saturday morning cartoons? We watching Captain Caveman get a date with a rock on the beach? Or are we watching pro wrestling? The Oscar championship celebration we talked about. Kyrie Sane introduced Oscar. She talked about how she was a Grand Slam champion. She then decided to play the recorder. I don't know what the hell she was trying to play. But then Nia Jax came out. She delivered a very bad promo, as we all know she does, talking about how they would have to they would have to have a real party when she becomes the champion. Asuka then attacked her for interrupting the party. This was just... As soon as Nia Jax came out and established that she was going to be the direction going forward for the Women's Championship, I just became immediately disinterested. We had another interview with Baron Corbin backstage. We've seen him complaining about not getting food before. Now he said that he's the one that chose this match tonight. He's the one that has carried Drew McIntyre for over a year. He beat Brock Lesnar, but that's not scaring the King from taking on Drew McIntyre tonight. He's going to expose him for all his mistakes and blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Bobby Lashley defeated R-Truth in under three minutes in an exact replica of what we seen last week. Continuing with that trend, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross defeated the Iconics. The same exact match that we've seen last week. The only difference here is that the WWE seemingly is going in the direction of breaking the Iconics apart, which I cannot shit on. I'm not going to be mad at that because it's something that I think would dissolve an act that is just absolutely mind-numbingly painful to watch, to listen to them talk, and the whole iconic thing is just over and done. It was done about six months after they started doing it, and it's been years. And you brought the Iconics back to break them up. Great. We need women in the women's division. Billy Kay, not sure if she's the one that's going to get the push. Peyton Royce is the better in-ring talent, and I hope for big things for both of them. And I want this breakup to actually happen because there is so many acts. There's only so many acts I can I can handle in one night. And the Iconics coming back is just more than Raw needs. It's just too much. It's just too much. Asuka and Kyrie Sane continue to celebrate in the back. They went separate ways and Nia Jax was creeping around in the back stalking them. Ridiculous. This continued on. Kyrie Sane was now alone, playing the recorder once again, and she was attacked from behind by Nia Jax. They followed this with the confrontation between Billy Kay and Peyton Royce. Billy Kay said this was their one chance to get their championships back, and Peyton was the one that blew it, and then she slapped Peyton Royce in the face. Peyton would then start to cry, then the other one start to cry. They hug and do like, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> So this is going to be on again, off again, until they finally just implode, and we will see the destruction of the Iconics at some point. If there is a wrestling god somewhere, that's where they're going with this. So knowing the WWE, just like they did with Sasha and Bailey a million times, they'll just forget this ever happened, mend the fences, and keep the tag team together, because they're not going to come up with any way to do anything interesting with it. Asuka then... Went after Nia Jax as well for beating up her friend. Like I said, these segments went on way too long. Way too much. They don't remember that they have a TV show next week. And the confrontation between Jax and the girls were was fine at the beginning, if that's where you wanted to go with it. All this other shit you did tonight was for next week's show. Should have had next week's show. Nia Jax attacked Kyrie Sane in the back. 
after she's playing a recorder if you must. And then the week after that, you have Asuka getting her revenge on Nia Jax in the back, unsuspect, unsus, unsuspectingly. And then you have the match at Backlash. It's that easy. You don't do three weeks worth of TV in one night. Doesn't help. It also doesn't help that you have Shayna Baszler defeating Natalia in a submission match in less than five minutes. This is Natalia. Right? Now, she's not the greatest in the world, but she is a graduate of the Heart Dungeon. We've seen her wrestle before. She's the longest tenured female right now on the roster, and she can't go more than five minutes with Shayna Baszler. And maybe that's a good thing because Shayna Baszler should be that much of a badass. But I don't understand why Natalia's flipping out. What, why is she so mad? What's going on? She can't get a win. All of a sudden, Natalia's flipping out. She's starting to be a crybaby. She's breaking up the Kevin Owens set as they're trying to put it in the ring. And how stupid is that, though? Why did why did they even write that? Well, Natalia, you stay in the ring as the guys are rolling out the rug. Because, you know, we're going to pretend like the guys don't even give a shit that you're even out there. The grounds team didn't give a shit that you're in the ring. That would be like... The Yankees hitting the field, getting ready to take the ninth inning. And then the grounds team just coming out and be like, nah, get out of here. This game is over, Ben. I mean, yeah, the match was over before this happened, but it's like, what are you waiting for? You don't see the guy with the big giant rug? Get out of there. And she starts throwing Kevin Owens' signs all over the place. <sighs> Absolute ridiculous. The Kevin Owens show kicks off. Andrade and Angel Garza were arguing with Austin Theory backstage. Zelina Vega stopped them. She's trying to get all the all her boys in line. She's like, "Do you understand me?" And Andrade's like, "I am the champion. I am Sancho." <laughs> okay, I don't know what that response was about. But the Kevin Owens show began. Kevin Owens said thank you to Natalia for destroying his set. And I don't know whether that was tongue-in-cheek or whether that was written for him to say because maybe it wasn't part of the show. I don't know. If it wasn't, then it was even stupider for her to do all that. I don't know. I did like what Samoa Joe had to say about what Nat- Natalia did. He mentioned the fact that, you know, she's supposed to be better than that considering where she comes from and that if she's going to cry and whine after every time she loses, maybe it's time for some time off. And maybe that's true for a lot of the people on this roster. But the Kevin Owens show was about Zelina Vega and the Sexy Boys. And the breakup that would ensue following the match. But it was really more even so about the return of Apollo Crews. This back and forth between everybody here really meant nothing. And it was very crowded once Apollo Crews got in there, he tackled Andrade. Garza and Theory tried getting involved, but then Kevin Owens would get involved. And guess what? Teddy Long must have been in the back because we had ourselves a tag team matchup booked from this meaningless confrontation. Kevin Owens and Apollo Crews would defeat the United States champion and Angel Garza, supposedly thanks to the interference caused or the miscommunication caused by Austin Theory at the end. Kevin Owens was brought back to put over Apollo Crews. Great. Apollo Crews is getting its shot at the United States Championship next week. I guess that's great. Kevin Owens wasted here. Did absolutely nothing for nobody. But after the match, Andrade attacked Austin Theory. He is now officially out. And he is going to move on to tighter pastures. He doesn't have long hair, so he's not going to be man bunning it up. But he's going to be one of the prophets of Rollins, I guess, going forward. Ridiculous. They talked to Drew McIntyre prior to his matchup. He says that he's got a Claymore ready or fit for a king for Baron Corbin. Aleister Black defeated Buddy Murphy with Seth Rollins at ringside via disqualification. They pulled the same shit that they pulled with Buddy Murphy. Austin Theory sat out there after his loss through the commercial break, through the interview with Drew McIntyre, through the axe-throwing contest finale, 
and waited for Seth Rollins to come and take his hand. And they would beat down Aleister Black at the end of this match. And earlier in the night, Aleister Black came out and saved Humberto Carrillo from a beatdown. But tonight, Humberto didn't return the favor and come and help Aleister Black with Austin Theory, Seth Rollins, and Buddy Murphy, which I thought was kind of crazy. But Austin Theory attacked Aleister Black at the request of Seth Rollins, which is what caused this matchup to go to disqualification. Just ridiculous. We then go to the back. Charlie Caruso is interviewing Apollo Crews. Too much Apollo Crews on this night. He said these have been the longest three weeks of his life, but he's realized he's had to reach deep down within himself. All he needed was an opportunity, and next week he's facing Andrade for the championship, which prompted Zelina Vega to show up for a little super sexy self and say she could that he could cut his losses and walk away with his knee right now or never walk again. Cruz would respond by saying Andrade better be ready. He wondered where Andrade was and figured he was scared to get slapped again. He told Charlie Caruso he's going to become the new United States champion next week. We go back to the axe-throwing bullshit. And the cop lectured the teams, the Viking Raiders and the Street Profits, about how dangerous the axe-throwing was. She decided to let them go with a warning because she thought Ivar was cute and she didn't think very much of Eric. I happened to glaze over or didn't talk about the one spot where the other member of the Street Profits... I always forget his name. D'Angelo Dawkins. He, in order to prove that the Street Profits weren't the ones that threw the axe into the cop's windshield, ended up hitting a bullseye, throwing the axe backwards without even looking at it in front of the cop to prove their innocence. This is the type of nonsense they put together for this night. And they finished it up with WWE Champion Drew McIntyre defeating Baron Corbin in a non-title match that I paid absolutely no attention to. Before the match even began, MVP and Lashley came out to watch from the stage. MVP says he was very impressed by Baron Corbin. I don't know what he's looking at. He also noted that Drew McIntyre held the WWE Championship. Lashley said McIntyre was on notice. He would pry the WWE title out of his cold, dead hands if he has to. And then we got this match, which was... And then after the match, McIntyre taunted Bobby Lashley from the ring, daring him to become the killer that he's supposed to be. And I liked what Drew McIntyre was saying to Lashley from the ring. Almost kind of goading him, saying, you know, you have not lived up to your hype. Be the guy I know you are. Be the guy you know you are. Come out here and fight me. MVP held back the big milk dud and they went off the air with Drew McIntyre posing as our WWE Champion. And that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, was Monday Night Raw on this Monday, May the 18th, 2020, where we all had a whole lot better things to do with our time. Thank you so much for joining me here once again on the channel tonight. All of you sledgeheads are awesome. Make sure you leave your comments down in the description below. This whole entire episode was in fact a poop hammer and I forgot to bring up the screen. I apologize. The poop hammer screen. There was nothing really specifically we could give it to singularly. It deserved for the entire show. Maybe we could have just gave it to Charlotte for shitting all over the women's division on a regular basis, but uh, maybe we'll try to remember to do that one next time. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up if you had a good time here today. If it made you laugh, if it made you cry, if it made you understand why, Monday Night Raw is a big steaming pile of crap, smash that thumbs up. Share this video with each and every one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world, especially if they need to understand why Monday Night Raw is a big trash heap. And make sure you leave your comments down in the description below. Don't forget to become a subscriber. Join the Sledgehead Army today. Become one of the over 2,000 awesome fans that are now becoming the coolest, newest faction in the entire internet wrestling community. All you gotta do is hit that subscribe, 
hit that notification bell to join the crew right now. Thank you so much, Sledgeheads. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is the team Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. His tag team partner, the World Heavyweight Champion of all the microphones in the world, Mr. Blue the Snowball, the most important member of the team, as always, each and every one of you. That, my friends, is going to do it, and we are out of here. And we will see you next time, right here on your new favorite wrestling show, the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV, right here on YouTube.com. We'll